In this video, we'll discuss world building habitable planets, what makes them habitable in the first place, and why an atmosphere of sulfuric acid is probably not suitable for life. Hey everyone, my name is Matthew, at least that's what this planet's inhabitants call me, and this video is part of a series where I'll be going through a science adjacent world building process step by step. Last time, we launched the universe into existence with its own Big Bang, and built the galaxy our soon to be created world will reside in. If you missed that video, the link should be here. For today's video, we're going to be world building, well, the world itself. We're going to create our own fictional planet that we'll be using as the base for all our other world building moving forward, looking at aspects like planetary composition, atmospheres, and even how planets are formed in the first place. So, without further ado, welcome to the world building corner. Alright, let's do this. To start, let's zoom in on one of the stars in the outer galaxy. Meet Primus. Primus is a class B star, six times the mass of our real life sun, and is located within a nebula. Primus formed roughly 3.1 billion years after the Big Bang, or 1.5 billion years after the creation of the supermassive white hole at the centre of the galaxy. Don't get too attached though, because after its very short 100 million year lifespan, it's about to go supernova. Primus isn't what we're particularly interested in though. We'll well build the solar system we're interested in soon. For now, what we are interested in is one of the very recently constructed small planets it had just within its orbit, that's just been flung out into the galaxy as a rogue planet. Let's call this planet Locus, which is Latin for the place, because this is the place where all our world building will occur. From here, we're going to determine some values that we will need moving forward. I'm not going to discuss any of the maths, but I'll show it on screen so that you can follow along for yourself. And there'll also be a link to a spreadsheet in the description that will do all the maths for you. First, we need to choose a mass and radius for locus. Let's say that it's 1.279 times the mass of Earth, and 1.137 times Earth's radius. From these two values alone, we're able to determine a lot of information about locus compared to Earth, such as its gravity, circumference, surface area, volume, and density, as well as its density in grams per cubic centimeter. We mentioned earlier that Locus is now a rogue planet, which means that it is a free-floating or wandering planet that has no host planetary system. It might still be within the galaxy, due to the gravitational pull of any central black holes, but it isn't bound to a star or a brown dwarf. Locus is going to spend the next billion years as a rogue planet staying within the nebula that it formed in, which we'll call the Parvocatus Nebula, or the Small Cat Nebula. Eventually, it's going to be picked up by the gravitational pull of the solar system that it's going to settle into. This isn't an overly uncommon story across our real life universe, though it's overwhelmingly more common for planets to form alongside the stars that they surround in their solar system. If this is what you're planning for your planet, know that most gas giants form first pretty much alongside their star, and then rocky terrestrial planets form within a hundred million years after their star. Importantly, we now need to determine the composition of Locus, both as a physical planetary body as well as its atmosphere. Locus is what's called a terrestrial planet, which is one of 17 types of planets if we're sorting them by composition. A terrestrial planet is an astronomical body composed primarily of metals and silicate rocks. They're almost always the planets closest to the star that they've formed around. And in our own real life solar system, we have four examples, Mercury, Venus, Earth, and Mars. 
I'm not going to go through the entire list of planet types, but some other well-known planetary compositions are desert planets like Arrakis in June, gas giants like Jupiter and Saturn, ice giants like Uranus and Neptune, and ocean planets like Manan in Knights of the Old Republic. If you wanted to, you could really go crazy and give a planet a composition of whatever you wanted. But if your planet is going to support life like Locus is, then you'll want to keep it as close to Earth-like as possible. In fact, even tweaking the percentages of elements like oxygen and carbon dioxide is extremely dangerous and possibly hazardous towards life. Seeing as the mass and radius of Locus is very similar to Earth, it's unsurprising that it will also have a composition like Earth. The values for Earth's composition are as follows, and we're going to keep things similar to avoid chemical difficulties down the road. We are, however, going to make a very slight adjustment that compositionally doesn't change Locus too much, but we're going to increase the amount of hydrogen and oxygen present on the planet by a tiny bit. On Earth, dihydrogen oxide, more commonly known as water, is one of the trace compounds and makes up just 0.02% of Earth's mass. Which sounds ridiculous, seeing as Earth's surface is over 70% water. But that's just it. Earth's surface is 70% water. The rest is not. We're going to increase the amount of water on Locus's surface. Not so much that it's a total water world, but enough to bring its water coverage to about 85 to 90 percent. I'm not even sure that would change the number of 0.02 percent, considering how small that number is compared to the rest of the planet's mass. But for simplicity, let's say that 0.03 percent of Locus's mass will end up being water. It's also important to state that we don't know the exact surface temperature of Locus at this stage, but as a rogue planet, its temperature is likely to be very cold. With no warming from a host star, Locus's temperature as a terrestrial planet is mostly dependent on how much its atmosphere can keep it from simply being at the background temperature of space, which is 2.7 kelvins, or negative 270 degrees Celsius. Now that's cold. This frigid temperature though actually works in our favour in terms of maintaining elements within the atmosphere, because the colder the planet, the more likely compositional elements will stay within the atmosphere due to being unable to reach the planet's escape velocity. Escape velocity is the minimum speed needed for a non-propelled object to escape the gravitational influence of a primary body, which in this case is the planet of Locus itself. This is the equation to determine whether an element will stick around within your planet's atmosphere based on the planet's mass, radius and temperature relative to Earth, but there are resources online that you can use to work it out for you. Specifically, there's a spreadsheet created by Artifexian that's easy to read and does the calculations for you. If you somehow don't know who Artifexian is, I'm absolutely amazed, and I wholly recommend checking out his channel. He's a guru on science-adjacent world building. I'll put a link to his video regarding Earth-like atmospheres in the description, and you can find the spreadsheet I'm talking about in that video's description. Once again, full credit to Artifexian for that. For Locus, if its average surface temperature is that of Pluto, which is 40 kelvins, then it would be able to keep all elements within its atmosphere except hydrogen. If we lower the temperature just a little bit below Pluto's temperature by say 10 degrees kelvin, then even hydrogen can stay within the atmosphere. So. As Locus hurdles through space as a rogue planet, let's say its average surface temperature sits at 30 degrees Kelvin, which is below Pluto's temperature, but above the background temperature of space. At this temperature, many elements that would normally be a liquid or gas on Earth would be a solid on Locus. In fact, at this temperature, only three elements aren't a solid, helium, hydrogen, and neon, all three of which exist as gases, though the temperature is very close to the temperature that neon exists as a liquid. 
At this stage, Locus might have some liquid neon in small pools on the colder parts of its surface, but not in great enough quantities to be even remotely significant. Seeing as hydrogen and helium can't escape the atmosphere, and that they're the only two elements that exist in gaseous forms, Locus's atmosphere at this stage would be almost exclusively hydrogen and helium, with trace amounts of neon. All the oxygen and nitrogen that would be present in an Earth-like atmosphere is currently frozen, or combined with other elements such as silicon to form minerals and other compounds. Now, you might be saying that Locus sounds like a frozen hellscape at this point, and you'd be absolutely right. Don't worry though, a lot of this is going to change once it's warmed up by a star. Before that happens though, let's give it an interesting point of history. Around 100 million years before it's picked up by the solar system it will settle into. Let's say that a spacefaring species used Locus as a mining and research colony for a short period of time. Not so long that it's affected the overall composition of Locus, but long enough that it has an abandoned settlement. This has some pretty strong world building implications, and already opens up a box of potential storytelling elements. Obviously, we've just stated that there are spacefaring civilizations already in existence, so we've just confirmed life outside of Locus. Add to that that they're likely to be billions of years more advanced than Locus, assuming they survive such a period of time. They have to be at least advanced enough to create a biosphere on Locus, or perhaps they're so alien compared to life as we know it that they're able to survive the extreme conditions that Locus presents. If you're interested in creating some ancient Lovecraftian Cthulhu monsters, this is a great way to introduce them to your planet, so that they're already there before life evolves. Maybe their colony even seeded life on Locus, or at least left the biological material necessary for life to start. This is the panspermia hypothesis of the creation of life, but that's something that we'll get into more when we start to establish life on Locus. For now, we've just set up the potential for panspermia, if that's the route we choose to take. Let's conclude that Locus had an unspecified spacefaring race establish a single minor settlement that has long since been abandoned, and that's likely to be 99% destroyed by the time life evolves on Locus. So, to recap, our planet, Locus, is a terrestrial planet that's slightly larger than Earth, with a slightly higher than Earth amount of water. While its composition is similar to that of Earth, it's currently a frozen wasteland that is hardly suited for supporting life, and will remain so while it's still a rogue planet, until it gets picked up by another host star. It did, however, have a group of ominous visitors for a short period of its history, though those visitors have long since left with almost no traces. Join me next time when we'll have Locus be pulled into the solar system that it will reside in, establishing its star or stars. You can find all the information for this video and other resources for world building in general over at worldbuildingcorner.com. And if you enjoyed this video, don't forget to like and subscribe to follow the world building journey. And until next time, stay awesome.